teach you. Because, nine things rooted in craving. Listen and attend closely. I will speak. Yes, Bhante, those bhikkhus replied. The Lord said this. And what are the nine things rooted in craving? In dependence on craving there is seeking. In dependence on seeking there is gain. In dependence on gain there is judgment. In dependence on judgment there is desire and lust. In dependence on desire and lust there is attachment. In dependence on attachment there is possessiveness. In dependence on possessiveness there is miserliness. In dependence on miserliness there is safeguarding. With safeguarding as the foundation originate the taking up of rods and weapons. Quarrels, contentions, and disputes, accusations, divisive speech, and false speech, and many other bad harmful things. These are the nine things rooted in craving. Abodes of beings because, there are these nine abodes of beings. What nine? There are, because, beings that are different in body and different in perception, such as humans, some devas, and some in the lower world. This is the first abode of beings. There are beings that are different in body but identical in perception, such as the devas of Brahma's company that are reborn through the first jhana. This is the second abode of beings. There are beings that are identical in body but different in perception, such as the devas of streaming radiance. This is the third abode of beings. There are beings that are identical in body and identical in perception, such as the devas of refulgent glory. This is the fourth abode of beings. There are beings that are non-perceptive, without experience, such as the devas that are non-perceptive. This is the fifth abode of beings. There are beings that, with the complete surmounting of perceptions of forms, with the passing away of perceptions of sensory impingement, with non-attention to perceptions of diversity, perceiving, space is infinite, belong to the sphere of the infinity of space. This is the sixth abode of beings. There are beings that, by completely surmounting the base of the infinity of space, perceiving, consciousness is infinite, belong to the sphere of the infinity of consciousness. This is the seventh abode of beings. There are beings that, by completely surmounting the base of the infinity of consciousness, perceiving, there is nothing, belong to the sphere of nothingness. This is the eighth abode of beings. There are beings that, by completely surmounting the base of nothingness, belong to the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception. This is the ninth abode of beings. These are the nine abodes of beings. Panna bhikkhus, when the mind of a bhikkhu is well consolidated by panna, he is able to assert. Destroyed is rebirth, the brahmacharya has been lived, what had to be done has been done, there is no more coming back to any state of being. And how is the mind of a bhikkhu well consolidated by panna? His mind is well consolidated by panna when he knows. My mind is without lust. His mind is well consolidated by panna when he knows. My mind is without hatred. His mind is well consolidated by panna when he knows. My mind is without delusion. His mind is well consolidated by panna when he knows. My mind is not subject to infatuation. His mind is well consolidated by panna when he knows. My mind is not subject to animosity. His mind is well consolidated by panna when he knows. My mind is not subject to confusion. His mind is well consolidated by panna when he knows. My mind is not subject to return to sense sphere existence. His mind is well consolidated by panna when he knows. My mind is not subject to return to form sphere existence. His mind is well consolidated by panna when he knows. My mind is not subject to return to formless sphere existence. When, bhikkhus, the mind of a bhikkhu is well consolidated by panna, 
he is able to assert. Destroyed is rebirth. The Brahmacharya has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming back to any state of being the stone pillar thus have I heard. On one occasion the venerable Saraputta and the venerable Kandakaputta were dwelling at Rajagaha in the bamboo grove, the squirrel sanctuary. There the venerable Kandakaputta addressed the bhikkhus. Friends, bhikkhus, friend. Those bhikkhus replied. The venerable Kandakaputta said this. Friends, Devadatta teaches the Dharma to the bhikkhus thus. When, friends, a bhikkhu's mind is consolidated by mind, it is fitting for him to declare. I understand. Destroyed is rebirth. The Brahmacharya has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming back to any state of being. Then the Venerable Saraputta said to the Venerable Kandakaputta, Friend Kandakaputta, it is not in such a way that Devadatta teaches the Dharma to the Bhikkhus. Rather, Devadatta teaches the Dharma to the Bhikkhus thus. When, friends, a bhikkhu's mind is well consolidated by mind, it is fitting for him. To declare, I understand. Destroyed is rebirth. The Brahmacharya has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming back to any state of being a second time. A third time the venerable Kandakaputta addressed the bhikkhus. Friends, Devadatta teaches the Dharma to the bhikkhus thus. When, friends, a bhikkhu's mind is consolidated by mind, it is fitting for him to declare. I understand. Destroyed is rebirth. The Brahmacharya has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming back to any state of being. A third time the Venerable Saraputta said to the Venerable Kandakaputta. Friend Kandakaputta, it is not in such a way that Devadatta teaches the Dharma to the Bhikkhus. Rather, Devadatta teaches the Dharma to the Bhikkhus thus. When, friends, a bhikkhu's mind is well consolidated by mind, it is fitting for him to declare. I understand. Destroyed is rebirth. The Brahmacharya has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming back to any state of being and how, friend, is the mind of a bhikkhu well consolidated by mind. His mind is well consolidated by mind when he knows. My mind is without lust. His mind is well consolidated by mind when he knows. My mind is without hatred. His mind is well consolidated by mind when he knows. My mind is without delusion. His mind is well consolidated by mind when he knows. My mind is not subject to lust. His mind is well consolidated by mind when he knows. My mind is not subject to hatred. His mind is well consolidated by mind when he knows. My mind is not subject to delusion. His mind is well consolidated by mind when he knows. My mind is not subject to return to sense sphere existence. His mind is well consolidated by mind when he knows. My mind is not subject to return to form sphere existence. His mind is well consolidated by mind when he knows. My mind is not subject to return to formless sphere existence. When, friend, a bhikkhu is thus perfectly liberated in mind, even if powerful forms cognizable by the eye come into range of the eye, they do not obsess his mind. His mind is not at all affected. It remains steady, attained to imperturbability, and he observes its vanishing. Even if powerful sounds cognizable by the ear come into range of the ear. Even if powerful odors cognizable by the nose come into range of the nose. Even if powerful tastes cognizable by the tongue come into range of the tongue. Even if powerful tactile objects cognizable by the body come into range of the body. Even if powerful phenomena cognizable by the mind come into range of the mind, they do not obsess his mind. 
His mind is not at all affected. It remains steady, attained to imperturbability, and he observes its vanishing. Suppose, friend, there was a stone pillar eight meters long. Four meters would be below ground and four meters above ground. If a violent rainstorm should then arrive from the east, it would not shake it or make it quake, wobble, and tremble. If a violent rainstorm should then arrive from the west, from the north, from the south, it would not shake it or make it quake, wobble, and tremble. For what reason? Because the stone pillar is deep in the ground and is securely planted. So too, friend, when a bhikkhu is thus perfectly liberated in mind, even if powerful forms cognizable by the eye come into range of the eye, even if powerful phenomena cognizable by the mind come into range of the mind, they do not obsess his mind. His mind is not at all affected. It remains steady, attained to imperturbability, and he observes its vanishing. Enmity then the householder Anathapandika approached the Lord, paid homage to him, and sat down to one side. The Lord then said to him, Householder, when a noble disciple has eliminated five perils and enmities and possesses the four factors of stream entry, he might, if he so wished, declare of himself. I am one finished with hell, the animal realm, and the sphere of afflicted spirits. Finished with the plane of misery, the bad destination, the lower world. I am a stream enterer, no longer subject to rebirth in the lower world, fixed in destiny, heading for enlightenment. What are the five perils and enmities that have been eliminated? Householder. One who destroys life. With the destruction of life as condition, creates peril and enmity pertaining to the present life and peril and enmity pertaining to future lives and he also experiences mental pain and dejection. One who abstains from the destruction of life does not create such peril and enmity pertaining to the present life or such peril and enmity pertaining to future lives nor does he experience mental pain and dejection for one who abstains from the destruction of life that peril and enmity has thus been eliminated. One who takes what is not given. Who engages in sexual misconduct. Who speaks falsely. Who indulges in liquor, wine, and intoxicants. The basis for slothfulness. With indulgence in liquor, wine, and intoxicants as condition, creates peril and enmity pertaining to the present life and peril and enmity pertaining to future lives and he also experiences mental pain and dejection. One who abstains from liquor, wine, and intoxicants. The basis for slothfulness, does not create such peril and enmity pertaining to the present life or such peril and enmity pertaining to future lives nor does he experience mental pain and dejection. For one who abstains from liquor, wine, and intoxicants, the basis for slothfulness, that peril and enmity has thus been eliminated. These are the five perils and enmities that have been eliminated. And what are the four factors of stream entry that he possesses? Here, householder, a noble disciple possesses unwavering confidence in the Buddha thus. The Lord is an Arahant, perfectly enlightened, accomplished in true knowledge and conduct, fortunate, knower of the world, unsurpassed trainer of persons to be tamed, teacher of devas and humans, the enlightened one, the Lord, he possesses unwavering confidence in the Dharma thus. The Dharma is well expounded by the Lord, directly visible, immediate, inviting one to come and see, applicable, to be personally experienced by the wise. He possesses unwavering confidence in the Sangha thus. The Sangha of the Lord's disciples is practicing the good way, practicing the straight way, practicing the true way, practicing the proper way. That is, the four pairs of persons, the eight types of individuals. 
This Sanger of the Lord's disciples is worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy of reverential salutation, the unsurpassed field of merit for the world. He possesses the virtuous behavior loved by the noble ones, unbroken, flawless, unblemished, unblotched, freeing, praised by the wise, ungrasped, leading to samadhi. These are the four factors of stream entry that he possesses. Householder, when a noble disciple has eliminated these five perils and enmities and possesses these four factors of stream entry, he might, if he so wished, declare of himself. I am one finished with hell, the animal realm, and the sphere of afflicted spirits. Finished with the plane of misery, the bad destination, the lower world. I am a stream enterer, no longer subject to rebirth in the lower world, fixed in destiny, heading for enlightenment.